I welcome everybody here this morning as we gather, gather together to worship God together. Every one of us is here because we want to get to heaven. At least I hope that's why we're all here. We're here to worship God in spirit and in truth, to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he gave for us, all for the purpose of one day getting to have a home in heaven forever. As we consider our life here on this earth, as we consider what God commands us to do in order to inherit eternal life, obviously, as we talked about, we worship, we pray, we sing hymns, we study his word. But in our everyday life, there is also the consideration of hour to hour, minute to minute, making sure we remember that we're to be servants of God every day. Not just on the Lord's Day, not just on Wednesday night, but every day in our workplace, in our school, at home, with our families, to make sure that we are still striving for heaven. That that's not just in our mind or our focus on Sunday when we come together to worship. There's a reason why in Ephesians 6 that Paul instructed the brethren to put on the helmet of salvation. That salvation would ever be present in their mind every day. Well, part of what God instructs us to do is to be a servant. And this morning, we want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a servant of the Lord. And we're going to look at this. We're going to narrow in because obviously we could talk all day about being a servant of the Lord and what different aspects and characteristics are necessary for us to be a proper servant. But we're going to look at two passages this morning. We're going to focus on two passages, one of which... Uh, we have studied a little bit, for those of you who uh, have been watching the uh, live stream Bible studies on Sunday and Wednesday, we've been studying from 2 Timothy. And one of the passages we just covered is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and starting in verse 22, where Paul is instructing Timothy, he's reminding him to maintain his purity of the faith, maintain the purity of the gospel, and to avoid those who teach things that are idle babblings, that have no profit in Christ, and certainly those things that are not of the truth of the gospel, such as Hymenaeus and Philetus and what they were teaching. Starting in verse 22, Paul makes the statement, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Notice he focuses on fellow brethren, not like Hymenaeus and Philetus, those who did not have a pure heart. He focuses on brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, who out of a pure heart call on the Lord. Those who were sincere in their effort to serve God, and certainly who also pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace uh, with all others. As he says in verse 23, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. He's not saying not to stand up for the truth of God's word. He defines this or he describes this foolish and ignorant disputes as in essence simply looking to pick a fight, an argument, a debate with people. Just for the sake of arguing and debating, not for the pursuit of truth. And notice what the end goal or what the end result is. It causes strife. Whereas, verse 24, notice how Paul's going to define for Timothy what a servant of the Lord does. Instead of striving with others, instead of trying to pick a fight with others, the servant of the Lord, verse 24, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, verse 25, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. One element that Paul is going to bring out to Timothy here, he describes characteristics, and you'll note how similar these characteristics are to the characteristics and qualifications of elders that we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. These are characteristics that Paul describes here not being as solely possessed by an evangelist or a minister or elders or deacons, but rather the servant of the Lord. These are characteristics that every Christian should possess. He says that the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. 
Again, be belligerent. Seeking to pick fights with people simply for the sake of arguing over it. But be gentle to all. And it's interesting because when Paul describes this, obviously we're talking about behavior and conduct with other people. But it speaks to the character that one possesses. Must not quarrel, but be gentle. This is the outward manifestation of what he's going to describe in verse 25, having humility. One who is humble, one who seeks to serve others and to help others, is going to be gentle. Isn't going to be belligerent, isn't going to be as quick to anger, isn't going to be trying to prove myself right no matter what. It's going to be only about the truth of God's word. And then as he says in verse 24, able to teach. This is a very clear uh, characteristic or qualification of elders that we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3. That elders be able to teach. But notice how this is not simply on elders. Every servant of God must be able to teach. And what that reminds us, what that informs us and helps us to apply is that he's not just talking only to men here. He's talking to every servant of God. So we're not just talking about in a public forum. We're not just talking about in a pulpit for a sermon or a Wednesday night invitation or in an adult Bible class. Whether it's one speaking to many or one speaking to one. The, the, the ability to share our conviction in God's word. The, the ability to share the reason of the hope that is in us. To be able to explain to others what salvation is about in Christ Jesus. That is able to teach. We don't have to think ourselves eloquent. We don't have to think ourselves ma master of words. We just have to be able to explain it. To be able to share with people why we believe in Jesus. Why we believe in forgiveness of sins through baptism. Why we believe in serving God in humility as he describes in verse 25, uh, the end of verse 24, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Such as Hymenaeus and Philetus that Paul brought up earlier. Those who stand contrary to the truth. Those who refuse to turn and repent. Those who refuse to submit to what God has commanded. We're talking about fellow brethren here, like Hymenaeus and Philetus, who refuse to change. What is our goal? To prove we're right? No. Our goal is to save their soul. That's what our goal is. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God, notice, perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Our goal is to share the truth, certainly with all people. With our brethren who may be sinning or who are following or practicing something that is wrong. The servant of the Lord is called to be true to the gospel. The servant of the Lord is called to care and love about the souls of others. The servant of the Lord is called to be humble. Verse 26, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Whether Hymenaeus and Philetus realized it, they had been taken captive by the devil. Their faith had been overthrown, and as Paul describes earlier in chapter 2, they were overthrowing the faith of others as well. And it is our job to love and care about souls so that not only can we get to heaven, but they may get to heaven too. When Paul describes these characteristics and he talks about humility or meekness, the recognition, certainly having a, a humble attitude is I'm not exalting myself, thinking myself better than anyone else. But having meekness also means I am controlled. I am restrained. And even though whoever we're talking to or studying with, it may be frustrating sometimes. We have to be able to maintain control, realizing it's not about us. It's about this person's soul and God's word. In Titus chapter 2, in the second passage we want to consider this morning, Titus chapter 2, 
Read with me starting in verse 1 what Paul writes to Timothy and how that he's sharing this with Timothy to share with the rest of the brethren. Or I keep saying, Tim, sorry, Titus. He's writing to Titus so that Titus can share this information with the brethren. Starting in verse 1 of Titus chapter 2. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. And of course, sound doctrine, the term doctrine, it gets a, it gets a bad rap today because the term doctrine itself means teaching. That's what the term doctrine means. It doesn't mean dogma. It doesn't mean uh, one particular religion set of rules or another religion set of rules. That's not what doctrine means. It means teaching. Sound or wholesome, nourishing teaching is what Paul's describing to Titus here. So what are words? What, what is the sound teaching that Paul wants Titus to know and that the brethren need to know, starting in verse 2. That the older men be sober, reverent, temper, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. Then we have the older women, verse 3. Likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. We have young women that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And then in verse 6, we have the young men. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. All of these characteristics, and in fact, many of these characteristics, part of the reason why Paul uses the, the phrase likewise, is that many of these characteristics are shared among all of the groups. The idea of being temperate, of being controlled, of being sober-minded, making proper judgments. But you'll notice that Paul addresses everybody, no matter what their age is, no matter what their gender is. And while we can focus, we could have an entire sermon just on each one of these specific age groups and gender roles. Notice what the end result is. We find that no matter what your age or your gender, male or female, all can serve. It's not just elders. It's not just deacons. It's not just the evangelist. Everyone can have a role. Everyone can not only serve God, but everyone can also serve one another in a congregation of God's people. And this is why Paul makes this description to, to Titus, so that these brethren can know you can be relevant. You can matter. It doesn't matter how old you get. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter how young you are. Sometimes, just like those who are elderly, sometimes the young may feel like they can't contribute anything. Yet Paul tells Titus that everyone has a role, everyone can serve and be a benefit and be an encouragement and help. I mean, some of the, time, some of the times I've heard elderly people tell me how much they appreciated some young person. I mean, maybe nine or ten years old. Come by and just kind of talk to them, maybe just for a minute or two, and how good it made them feel. Or how often a, a, a younger person, a teenager, I've had conversations with teenagers in the past who, you know, they, they get to sit down. Sometimes it's not really cool to think about for young people in our generation to really think about sitting with older people and listening to what they have to say. But I have talked to younger people who have sat there for about five or ten minutes, heard a story told by an older person, said, that was actually kind of neat. I didn't know that's how things used to be. And, and it kind of helps put things into perspective. How hard. I remember listening to my grandfather growing up and how hard he used to work. Baling cotton. Baling hay. How heavy those things were. My grandfather was in great shape when he was my age. Great shape. Difference in, in time and technology. These opportunities are provided to us. For those of us who are older, the age, the wisdom, the experience, to be able to share with those who are younger. For those of us who are younger, to share our vigor, our vitality, our zest for life, our joy in things. To share that with others as well. Every one of us can be a benefit and an encouragement to one another. 
But then Paul goes on to say to, Tim, or to Titus himself in verse 7. And he's not saying this as just because Titus is an evangelist. He's saying this because Titus is a Christian, verse 7. In all things, show yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine or teaching, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about you. Remember, what was one of the characteristics that we noticed that Paul told Timothy about in 2 Timothy chapter 2? Able to teach. And I suggest to you that here in verse 7, Paul's not just saying this to Titus as an evangelist. This is because he is a Christian and all Christians in the things that they do must show a pattern of good or beautiful works. Works that show we serve God, not ourselves. Works that harmonize with our words, not contradict them, making us hypocrites. Show yourself a pattern of good works in what you say, in what you teach to others. Show integrity. Stand fast to the truth. Don't flip flop all the time. Know the truth and stand firm in it. Show reverence to it. Incorruptibility. Sound speech. Or pattern of speech. The way you converse with people. The way you talk to people, whether it includes spiritual elements, biblical elements, or not. The type of speech you use with others can either be part of that pattern of good works, or it can be part of what many people see among the religious community as being those who are hypocrites. Who say one thing, and their words sound holy and righteous, but the way that they act, or the way the things that they do contradict it. We have to be willing to stand firm in the truth. We have to be willing to serve God in all the ways that he has commanded us to do so. And one of those ways is to make sure we're seeking to be a servant to others. The servant of the Lord must be true to the gospel. In fact, the first duty of every Christian is to be true to the gospel. But the servant of the Lord must also realize we have to focus on helping others. Seeing people not just as faces in a crowd or faces at work or faces at school, but to train ourselves to see them as souls. Souls that need to hear the truth. To see each other, not just for our names, not just as brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, but as souls who need to be encouraged. All of us need to be encouraged. Whether we're going through a difficult time right now or not. All of us need to be encouraged. All of us need to be reminded to stay true to God's word. All of us need to be propped up and helped to get to heaven. Because none of us are going to get there by ourselves. This is why God has designed the church the way that he has. Because we help each other get to heaven. We need to make sure we love one another. When you look at these characteristics, when you look at what we're called to be as a servant of the Lord, both in regard to serving God and His Word and serving others, one component that is maintained throughout it all is love. That it's not just obligation, it's that I love God. And I love His Word. Psalm 19 there's a hymn that we often sing that comes from Psalm 19. How that the psalmist David, how he loves God's word. How he loves his commandments. How he loves what God has given. Do we love God's word? Not just feel obligated to study it. Do we love it? Do we love our brethren? To encourage and edify. Do we love our neighbor, our co-worker, our classmate? Do we love our family at home? If so, let's make sure we serve. We serve them, we serve God, and let's be consistent in that service. The lesson is yours this morning.
Hope that this is something that's beneficial for us to consider and to be mindful of as we continue in a world where constantly we are seeing people seeking only to serve themselves. We must be mindful to take care of each other. I was listening to my Gamecocks play last night. We lost. I hope there's no Tennessee volunteers here. I'm, I'm not going to talk today. No, that's all right. But there was a quote from one of our players that was brought up on TV last night. And I hadn't heard it before. I thought it was a really good quote. J.C. Horn, one of our defensive backs, was asked about the state of society and everything going on. He said, you know, he said, this is all I'm going to say about all that. He said, as far as I'm concerned, football is a great epitome or a great uh, example of life. He said, on a football team, we're all brothers. On a football team, we're here to take care of each other. On a football team, when somebody falls down, we help them up. We are family. He said, and that's the way everybody should look at each other. And I thought that was a great quote. I thought that was excellent. Because if more people saw each other as people of souls and of value, maybe people would treat each other better. Let's make sure we're doing so as God has commanded us. We offer an invitation to those who are not Christians to be baptized, to have your sins washed away, be added to the body of Christ, enter into a family that loves God and that loves each other and that seeks to get to heaven together. For those of us who are Christians, we must remind ourselves not to be so proud as to think that I don't need help. We all need help from each other. Maybe it's just one kind word here or there, just in passing, but you never know how much a kind word may impact somebody. Let's make sure we're serving God and taking care of one another as we ought. The lesson is yours. If you need help in any way this morning, come forward as we stand and sing.